Good evening and welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board regular business meeting, Tuesday, October 10th, 2017. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item one on tonight's agenda are adjustments to the agenda. Do we have any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Seeing none. Item number two, may I have a motion please? I move that we approve the school board minutes from the executive session September 12, regular business September 12, workshop September 26, and special business September 26, 2017. A second. Discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Item three, comments by student representatives. Hi, I'm Allison Ingalls. Um, Emily Healy will not be here tonight um, as she has a soccer game. So I'm hoping to just give a brief overview of on the happenings at Cape Elizabeth um, High School right now. So tomorrow the students will take the PSAT grades 9th, 10th, and 11th, um, and the seniors will have a late start. Um, and this week is actually homecoming, so we kicked off the festivities today with USA Day, um, and we will come culminate Friday with a pep rally, a football game, and hopefully a bonfire if weather improves. Um, and then we'll have a homecoming dance Saturday night from 9 to 11. Um, and sports are in full swing, definitely. The volleyball team is doing great. They are 12-0. and 0. Um, Last Thursday, ju they just had a big win at First Falmouth, sorry. Um, and the golf team won the Class B state title um, on Saturday by 24 strokes. That's the team final. Um, and they'll t have individual states this Saturday. Um, and then boys soccer and girls soccer are doing well. They both have games today. And finally, football um, is four and two, and they have a game this Friday at home. Um, the first math meet went well. Um, there was a big turnout. Cape Elizabeth actually had the most amount of students from any school representing, so that participation was great. Um, as, we mentioned, as I mentioned last week, or last meeting, sorry, um, the Yellow Tula Project, um, the idea about mental health awareness. Um, we'll actually be planning the garden either this week or next week, so that's an exciting thing um, that we have on the upcoming schedule. Um, the activities fair went really well, and there seems to be a general excitement on the clubs um, and a lot of enthusiasm, especially we have a lot of freshmen excited, which is great to see them acclimating to the high school setting. Um, there still seems to be a bit of controversy over the habit of work grades. One conflict that has arose is the question of whether ineligible means to simply participate in sports clubs and activities contests or activities in all, including practices. Um, including practices in this ineligibility would prove to be somewhat of a problem because a two-week suspension would most likely eliminate the remainder of the season because many coaches have policies that um, if you miss a certain amount of games, you miss the equivalent number of practice, or if you miss a certain number of practices, you miss the equivalent number of games, um, which would potentially take out an entire season, um, which would be sort of a punishment that I don't think that we're looking to, to give. Um, and then, one other issue that has been brought to my attention is simply like the black and whiteness of um, the how grades. Um, because it's a zero to one scale, there really isn't any room for ambiguity, um, which can be hard because say a student completes three fourths of their homework, they're still given a zero. Or um, in the case that a teacher evaluates how grades on a weekly basis instead of a daily basis, which other teachers do do, um, there will be, they, a student could turn in four out of five assignments in a week, um, 
and still receive a zero. Um, so one proposal for that issue is um, having a scale. Many other schools do this, um, like one through four, just giving a little bit more range. And then of course, eligibility could be determined off that, um, just having a, a place um, marking that. And then that's about it. Hopefully we'll see some clearing up of the how grades. We've had um, meetings with all four grades, Mr. Shedd, um, about just sort of to clarify the details. And I think the teachers are starting to get the hang of it too, which is definitely helping. Um, so yeah, that's all I have for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item number four, comments from the public on agenda items. Hello, my name is Chris Straw, 597 Shore Road. I wanted to make some comments on item 5C of the agenda, uh, which is the MEA results uh, that Ms. Stanko will be giving you a presentation on. Uh, as an initial matter, to the extent that any of you are looking for independent justification or affirmation of your decision to have the director of curriculum be a full-time position, this is one reason why we needed to have it as a full-time position. So kudos for deciding to do that during the last budget cycle. So uh, I assume all of you have looked at the data. To the extent you haven't, I highly encourage you to really dig into it. Uh, ask Ms. Snaker as many questions as you can with respect to the data. And there's one aspect of the data I wanted to focus on in particular, uh, because it's of great interest to me, and it's also probably of interest to two of you on the board, at least, if not all of you. And that's the data with respect to the class of 2025, which, for those of you that don't know, since I don't speak your lingo, uh, it's the current fifth graders. So if you look at the data for the current fifth graders, you'll see there is a significant drop off in our math scores. And there's some questions that are raised from that. Why do we see this drop off? Uh, and there's a couple potential uh, answers. One would be it was the switch over from Smarter Balance to Empower Main or Empower ME, whatever the test transition was. Uh, but yet, if you look at the other di uh, districts, which I'm probably uh, front running Ms. Stanker's presentation, if you look at the other districts, such as Yarmouth and Falmouth and uh, the MSAD that she included, you see we are the only district that had as significant drop off as we see for that group. So it's something else. It isn't the transition from the data. So what else could it be? Um, it could be our curriculum. It could be some, something with our curriculum. We need to dig into this. We need to find that out. One way we can get down into that data, and you guys have the ability to get to this data, and I realize the district just got their hands on the last week, and I'm sure Ms. Stinkard will be digging into this in detail. Um, you can do an anonymous assessment uh, of did these problems arise from one particular classroom? Is it all the classrooms? If it's all the classrooms, it's probably something with our curriculum. But if it is uh, derived from one or two classrooms, and yes, you have the ability to dig into this with the data, uh, that raises some other questions that will need to be addressed. So long story short, this is really, really valuable data. I strongly encourage you to dig into it. In particular, dig into what in the world happened with the class of 2025, because we deserve answers. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak to agenda items tonight? Seeing none, moving on to item five, communications. We'd like to start with um, Portland Arts and Technology High School program students. Mr. Shen. So I'd like to introduce Andy Erskine, uh, who's here to talk about his experience at PADS. I've been looking around for another student. I was expecting another student, but I'm thinking something came up with his family that he's probably not able to attend. Um, the other student was Antonio Vasilian, who was prepared to talk about the masonry program. But, but we're happy to have Andrew here. Um, and this is Andrew's teacher, Beth Milroy, um, who's been helping him get ready for this presentation. So take it away, Andrew.
My name is Andy Erskine. Went to PAFS today. I am taking orders to kids. So Andy's going to share with you some of his experiences at PATS and the food service program. And he's passing around some photos um, that he's going to describe, as well as a couple of packets similar to what he's reading from. But he has the colored copy. You're going to get the black and white. <laughs> Taking orders is a fun job because I take to take take get to talk to other kids. I use the iPad to take orders, then my friend cooks the food. I take food to kids in other classes. It's hard to balance the tray sometimes, but I have not spilled yet. <laughs> we wear hats and aprons and glasses. Pizza. Making pizza is my favorite job, eating pizza, and also my favorite at Paths is making the dough. This is pizza. This pizza is on Friday, all by myself. I use the biggest mixer, one batch, uses 24 cups of flour. Cookies. Some of the other kids make their these cookies. My job is wrap them up. If I bring some money, I can buy one. <laughs> They look really good, and also always want to eat the cookie dough that is in the walk-in fridge. <laughs> Going to the past makes me smile, and I love it. Done. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know what you're talking about with that cookie dough. It's hard <laughs> to resist. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank you very much. Thank you. Just Thank a quick you. Congratulations, Andy. Thank you for a terrific presentation. Public speaking is some people's greatest fear. You did a fantastic job. Thanks for presenting tonight. Thank you. Moving on to item 5B, principles update. And Mr. Mangeridis could not be with us tonight because of a family conflict. Right, and I believe the principals are, are going to bow uh, out so that Kathy can jump into this MEA. Am, am I right about that? Right. right. So Excellent. that's just a... We'll move on to item 5C. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to project the slides, so apparently the... The uh, projector takes a few minutes to warm up, so while that's happening, um, I made enough changes to the presentation following a really helpful meeting this morning with the three principals that I'm actually going to give you new copies and then it will be updated on the website.
Okay, great. So I'm here to talk to you about the results of last spring's um, MEA testing. And I'm going to start with. Whoops. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with a quick review of um, of why we have these tests and what they do. Um, we are required by the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is better known as NCLB or ESSA, is the most recent iteration of the ESEA, it stands for Every Student Succeeds Act, requires annual testing um, in ELA and math in grades three through eight and in the third year of high school, and in science in grades five, eight, and the third year of high school, and that is typically 11th grade, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and then the, uh, the MEA, Main Education Assessment for ELA Literacy and Mathematics, in grades three through eight is called the Empower Me or Empower Main. And this is the second year of the Empower Main testing, which is um, useful to us because now we can um, look for growth in our students from one year to the next. Um, in grade 11 or that third year of high school, the assessment is the SAT. And then we have the MEA Science. Um, <clears throat> again in grades five, eight, and the third year of high school. So performance is reported at four levels, at state expectations, above state expectations, below state expectations, and well below state expectations. Um, and along with getting the results of last spring's testing, we have to the ESEA report card, which is part of that federal mandate, and it's based on the prior year's data, and there's a link to it if you're interested in looking at it. Any questions so far? I cannot get used to this mic, okay. I hope I'm not blasting you. Um, all right, so the first slide shows the performance of our district um, relative to um, the state, which appears now in the, at, the, at the far right. You can see that the state, um, entire district, the state in ELA literacy um, at all grades um, came to 52 and 58 percent at or above proficient at or above state expectations, so how we define proficiency. Um, the four districts that are depicted here were the highest performing school districts in the state. Um, if I didn't include in that the districts that have fewer than, uh, fewer than 200 students who took the test, because that would include schools like um, charter schools like Baxter Academy or districts that are just a single school district. So um, just looking at districts that had more than 200 students who took the test, these were the top four. So a lot worth celebrating here then that um, Cape Elizabeth um, is in the top four and um, our, as a district we, our students who were at or above um, state expectations were at 66, 76, excuse me, 0.38 percent. Yep. These are composite scores for all grades tested. Correct. Yep. This is this is uh, district by district. And then the next slide shows district performance in math. And are you able to read the numbers, or would you like me to read them to you? You can see them. We can read them. We can see them. You can see them. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so again, the state was at 38.54%, so um, quite a bit lower than in ELA literacy, and that was true for all of the districts as well. Okay, and then science. Um, less of a difference between the state performance and the top four performing school districts. And I'm not sure I made clear that we were, the, we were <coughs> those four districts depicted were, top, were the top four in all three content areas. Okay, I'm actually gonna start with science, which is a change from the original handout you received, um, because the, for reasons that I'm gonna explain, that the, the data, the science data is actually less, less valuable to us than the, than the ELA literacy and math data. Um, but before I get into that, just a few words about the test. Um, it is a paper pencil test. Um, it's aligned to the main learning results and not to the next generation of science standards, which is one of the reasons why the data is less valuable to us. Um, we, like all of the other districts in the state, are aligning our curriculum to the next generation of science standards. We anticipate 
that those will eventually be passed um, by the state legislature, that they will vote to adopt them as our state standards. Um, but so we don't want to put a lot of time into um, getting our students ready to do well on an assessment that is um, more than likely going to go away. There is a bill before the legislature, um, <clears throat> and um, we're hopeful that it will pass. They'll start, they'll take it up again in January. Um, as far as the test sessions go, so there are three 30 minute sessions for grade five, three 35 minute sessions for grade eight, and two 50 minute sessions for grade 11. We had participation rates of 96% this year, and then there's a link to the release, released items um, if you're interested in looking at those. Um, the second reason, in addition to the fact that they're aligned to the MLR and not the NGSS, um, that the data is less valuable to us is that you don't have cohort data. Um, so as you'll see on the next slide, um, you can only look at how one group of students did in the fifth grade and then how the next year's fifth graders did. But, but we, can't, we can't establish whether um, a particular group of students improved. Um, we just, what this data tells us is probably more about the relative strengths and weaknesses <coughs> of specific cohorts. Um, so in that case, then you want to make sure that your data is comparable to the districts with which you compare yourself. And so um, in the case of the fifth grade, um, we, uh, in the 2015-2016 school year, we actually were the highest performing school district in the state, and then last year we were um, the third highest performing school district in the state. Any questions about that? Just a, a general question. I was looking through some of this data, this, mm -hmm. and some of the changes all seem to be, some of them relatively minor. I'm just also wondering a little bit about um, what's the persistence of these data? So, in other words, if you take the same exam twice, you're going to get different scores. It will start to focus around a result. So, what's the sort of expected variation around these? So, some of what we're seeing is noise, and some of it may be cohort to cohort. Some of it may be something that's real that we need to pay attention to. And so, knowing the scale of what those noise levels are, expected noise levels are, is very helpful in looking at the data. And I can actually get, so, on average, it's uh, on our, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, I, I did dip into that a little bit today, and um, they have uh, a, a table. There is on the state website a table that looks at accuracy and consistency, and there's a whole lot of st st statistics underlying it. But basically, they would say that 90% um, of the time, the same group of students um, would perform at the same level. So, right. and I can right. share that chart Within with you. Which what band is what I'm asking? Right. So, in other words, if your true score, you do it a, a whole bunch of times, it's going to be 95, the band might be between 90, you know, three points, or it might be 10 points, depending on the test, depending on the number of right. observations, those right. kinds of things. Yeah, and that data is available. So, so uh, it's helpful sometimes in mm -hmm. characterizing this to be able to, just, particularly when there are small differences, to know what that is, because you don't want to be chasing noise. Right. I agree. So. And, or, and, if, and if there isn't much, then that's also important to know. Okay. Uh, so then grade eight. Again, um, the, without having dug in a, a, a good deal, these, these the differences that we're seeing don't, don't appear to be um, super significant. And then for 11th grade, more of a drop one year to the next, which could be about the cohort, it could be about the test, it could be about the sorts of things you're talking about, John, we just don't know. Are they going to release enough items this year for you to be able to dig in item analysis-wise to see if it's content that's tricking us up? I don't know if that's the case with science. But I'll look into it. So, I just always want to be clear. Uh, I think there may be some real significant differences here, but to be able to calibrate that, that's why the, the, the confidence level stuff is important. 
important. And it really changes group to group, big groups, so you might have a, a very confident narrow range. Smaller groups, it gets, can get wide, very wide. Okay, thank you. All right, so the Empower Me assessment then, just a reminder about this, grades three through eight, it's online, it's static, um, not adaptive anymore like the Smarter Balance assessment was. It is aligned to the main learning results, um, but that includes the Common Core. So we've been aligning our curriculum to the Common Core, so therefore um, we're all set. There and then there's a description of test sessions, two math, two reading, two running language, and one essay. Um, and we have excellent participation rates, 100% at Hong Cove and 97% at the middle school. And again, there's a link to released items. And we, we got the data last week, so we have not started digging into those released items. So, okay. So here we have the year-to-year -year comparison. So. Um, the third grade two years ago, and then last year's three, third grade, the fourth grade two years ago, and then last year's four, fourth grade, etc. Again, this is um, just so you could see how the um, how the grades were doing relative to each other. Um, and but I'm personally more interested in the cohort data, which is on the next slide. Okay, so this then, um, so this shows the performance of individual cohorts, and I had the classes wrong in the presentation uh, that the slides that you looked at originally. So, the if you start at the right, the class of 2021 is actually our current ninth grade. So this is showing how they did, how that class did when they were in seventh grade in 2015, 2016, and then how they did when they were in eighth grade, so in 2016, 2017. So it's the current fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and ninth grade, left to right. And this is what we want to see. Our students are improving every year. Third to fourth, fourth to fifth, fifth to sixth, sixth to seventh. Um, they drop a little bit in the eighth grade and taking this test, not to make excuses, but they're second semester eighth graders. And if you've lived with a second semester eighth grader, it may not come as a surprise to you that um, there, there might be a dip. That's just Again, I don't want to be complacent, but um, and we'll certainly look at it. But um, if there were going to be a place where I was going to see a dip, I, I, second semester eighth grade is probably one where I would predict. Okay, and then in math, the picture is oh, this actually before I get so this again is just looking at. <laughs> One grade three cohort and another grade three cohort, one grade four cohort, cohort, another grade four cohort, cohort. So you can see that um, fifth grade, that fifth grade test is more difficult or, anyway, or, or um, the preparation is different. Anyway, that's something, something to look at, but it's not like we had um, uh, a huge, drop from one year to the next in that grade um, that we've been looking at. And then the next slide shows the cohort data. And so again, this is showing the current fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth, and how they did in the two previous years. So this cohort picture is a little bit more mixed than the ELA literacy cohort picture was. We see a decrease in student performance from third to fourth grade and from fourth to fifth grade. Um, so I was interested in looking at other school districts and seeing whether the same pattern was observable in those places. Um, and that's what the next slide shows. So this is showing the class of 2025, which is actually 
our current fifth grade, so going from third grade to fourth grade, um, and then looking at the same in the um, other three top performing districts. And you can see that three of the four showed a decline. And then looking at the class of 2024, um, Baldur's districts showed a decline. And I do think it's important that we look at why the Cape Elizabeth decline was so much greater um, and why the overall number is so much lower. And that's certainly something that we'll be taking a look at. But I did want to point out that <coughs> every cohort um, showed, in, showed a decline. Every class of 2024 cohort showed a decline. Okay, so, well, any questions about the numbers? I, I just um, am glad to hear you say that some of these overall numbers are still in a, frankly, kind of unacceptable range. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. And I um, wouldn't expect to see us performing in the 50th percentile of proficiency in this community. So I'll be... Um, happy to hear from you a little later about two things. One is use of the early release time toward professional mm -hmm. development around math. And second of all, um, how we're going to really use those newly funded uh, RTI coaches to yes. assist kids that are struggling. Um, because I do know that some of our comparison districts have a lot greater capacity for support personnel than Cape mm -hmm. has enjoyed in, in the past. But those numbers should be a bit concerning. And I hear that from you too, so thank you. Okay, so um, ongoing work at Pond Cove and next steps that we have planned um, in terms of curriculum instructions. So you know that we're engaged right now in um, uh, writing learning targets and scoring criteria. Um, in ELA literacy particularly, um, and that that work is supported by the professional development. We've engaged two consultants to work with our Pond Cove teachers on the PD Wednesdays. Um, and I, the, the, the feedback for their work has been very, very positive. Teachers feel like they're learning a lot, and that they're able to implement what they're learning in the classroom right away. And the fact that it's occurring, that the professional development that they can try, they can learn something, and they can try it out and come back and talk about it. That that schedule is working really, really well for them. We've also been having uh, conversations around the need for keyboarding, um, which hasn't been consistently taught, and we think that that would help our students um, on these tests. Um, it's also just part of the Common Core that students be able to that they be able to keyboard, and so we are. Um, beginning that instruction in the third grade. And for this year, only May uh, offer it in the fourth grade as well. And so it's just there using a, a tap touch program on the iPad. And then, uh, and then our grade three and grade four teams are engaged in sub, are going to engage in subscore analysis. We do have a fair amount of subscore data by the individual students. So um, that will be very useful to us, um, both from a curriculum instruction point of view and also in terms of intervention. So as far as intervention goes, um, we, we, we do feel more supported this year and thank you for that. We have four RTI teachers instead of three and a half. That tier three intervention, that really intensive intervention that's typically pull out is ongoing. Um, we're in the process of um, completing NWE testing and once that's done, then um, we'll start to push in with our uh, RTI at techs and um, we have five now instead of two and that's we, we anticipate that that's going to be really beneficial in terms of ensuring that students get the support that they need in order to meet our standards and then once we um, have the you know dig down into drill down into the MEA results and then we also have the NWE data um, that we will be reconfiguring those tier two and tier three lists and just and that work will be done, overseen by the student support team. And we are using the NWA rather than the STAR. I think we've talked about that before. Um, the middle school teachers had 
um, given both the NWA and the STAR, and they felt that the NWA data was much more accurate. And we felt like we really needed to pick one assessment so that we could see how students did over a period of time. So now we'll have longitudinal data in grades three through eight. Actually, we're doing the, um, actually starting at the, uh, in the spring of kindergarten, so we're gonna have uh, longitudinal data in grades one through eight. It's a slightly different assessment, but. Any questions about Pond Cove? Just a, just a, oh, go ahead. So, um, this data is relatively new, and has the staff had a chance to sort of yeah. talk about the data? Like I just met with the principals okay. this morning. I'm sort of wondering, I was interested to hear back in the future yes. a little bit in terms of, so were these results expected or not expected? And if they were expected, what did they think was going on? And if they weren't expected, that's a different conversation. Because uh, you know, teachers have seen lots of grades go through, could often have a very, you know, it's a, it's a qualitative view on things. Right. You may have, uh, it may offer great insight as to where you uh, think about putting your efforts, um, and as well as a way to, to, to have a, um, an approach that you can think, well, if it's this, we can try this and, and see a result or not. You can be able to test out what people think may be going on. But if it's a surprise, it's a different conversation. So right. I'd be and interested to know what the result of that dialogue is. And do you mean surprise in terms of the overall results or surprise in terms of individual students? Uh, overall. Okay. Overall. Yeah, I mean, so this is only the second year of this assessment, so I don't know that there was a lot of predicting going on in that regard, but um, but I think that the subscore data will be very useful. I mean, it, that will, sh I think it's important that teachers see how the subscore data aligns to the curriculum instruction that they're delivering. It, it, it might be of these testing, but we've been testing our students for <laughs> years and years and years and years, and many teachers have seen tests over years and years and years, and variation over years and years, and have, often have a view as to what's going on. Okay. You, you sort of just touched on it, but I'll, I'll be curious when you do um, look at the subscores, which show the individual student, is that what it means? From the the subscore data is actually like, Within like a math curriculum, right? You would have um, you'd have your uh, numeracy, you'd have your um, uh, algebra, and so it's it's that's what I mean by subscore. It's 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 the curricular subscore. But we also have your exactly right. exactly algebra, I was geometry, going to ask you to numeracy. Explain a little bit more yeah, about yes, 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 and how so, you use it. And um, so we would want to see is their alignment between, if, if there are 30 questions, well actually we saw this and Jeff will be speaking to this in terms of the high school, but um, one of the things that was observed around the SAT was that there were many more statistical questions and there were questions about geometry. And so that changes the curriculum and I mean it should change the curriculum, right? So that's what we want to see is their alignment between what the test is emphasizing and what we are emphasizing in our curriculum. Um, so that's that's where this the that's the value of the subscore data, just in terms of your in terms of a class as a whole. The subscore data is also really helpful in terms of individual student performance, where um, the student may actually be proficient in two of the three areas that in curriculum areas that informed the score, but because they were really low in one area, that brought them down. So we'll be doing both of those things. And, and that's great, and I would love to know when you get to that point, what, it, what data you what you glean from that data once you mm -hmm. sort it out. I am happy to come back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then, um, at the middle school, and Mr. Eastman is free to join me for this. Or to the extent that he's, he's right here. I don't, um, to, I don't need to read it all. <laughs> um, but I think basically what we're talking about and how we're going to use our intervention is, is that we now have two. Um, I, I believe we had one before, so mm -hmm. one person covered four grades, now there's two. So we have twice as much um, coverage. I believe is we're going to, as a, as a team, sit down and look at the test scores and stuff to, to get to those a little bit. It's really what we did was we got to pack those things to see, you know, what areas were we strong in, what areas were we not. And I think it's eventually going to be able to be effective. 
limited at writing the prescription that's going to help solve some of the problems, we kind of going to know what the symptoms are, right? So that seems like a good way to think about it to me. And then when you look at the larger spreadsheet, which says all kids, then I think it's easier to group and regroup kids. Right now, we're providing intervention um, pull out to about over 22, between 22 and 25 kids, between the two of them. So it's it's going, but I'm not. We were using limited data because we didn't have our interviews, but we didn't have this this test score. So now it's time to, to kind of reload. Um, we're also pushing in services into three classrooms right now, uh, which really is more of a totality, you know, total approach as opposed to just helping a couple of kids. So that's kind of the direction they're in. I think this is going to provide us more of a targeted approach as to what's going on with this group of kids. And it may be different for this group than this group. Some may have done better on some of the subtests than others, and I think it's important that we're teaching the right things to the right kids. Now that sounds really easy, but it's not like you have to go in there and really kind of dig around a little bit and see. So that's kind of our next steps, is looking forward to that. The professional development days have been um, very successful. The early release days we've been two. The first one was really Kathy and I talking about setting the direction for the district, mostly proficiency based education, things like that where we're at. The, then the next one, um, my interventionist ran and I said, hey, this is what I need. You guys can run it. I find that more powerful than me standing up there talking because it's here um, kind of leading that. And it was, some of the feedback was awesome, but it was really about, here's this tool, the NWEA, which produces a ton of data. And often we just look at the grid score and say, oh, we're going to group them like that. It's really not the right way to do it all, totally, because different different parts go into that and score. My strengths may be different than Kathy's, but in the end we may have the same average. But I really need help on something different than Kathy. Does. So um, that whole professional development was designed around, here's this tool, the NWEA, we showed them a couple of reports they could run to kind of really start to show what some kids do, and then turn it to the next step to say, so if you had this, this profile and you needed a tier two intervention, we have Khan Academy and we have IXL, and this is how you would use it show them how to go into that next step of doing that. So really trying to help teachers support them with the in-class support, which is really tier one, a little bit of tier two, as we're really just getting ready to identify the kids to pull up for more intensive direct support. So that's kind of where we are. I'm so very excited about having interventionists. This is, without them, it's another thing that's put on the plate of the teachers. And when your plate is pretty full, it's hard to find a place, like where do you, what do you value the most? something usually has to go. So this is the top priority as far as we've set the middle school for the interventionists. It's really let's target the, the great kids and get them the support they need so that we're kind of working in the right direction. So that's where we are, that's where we're going. Um, and the next steps are really sitting down and working with this, stuff, with this information. Yeah, I wanted to put in a plug for the, uh, the subscore analysis and analysis the released items that's going to take place in that work we hope will be facilitated by the content leaders which is a new position that you're going to be asked to vote on uh, later in the evening so any other questions or thoughts about the middle school all right we'll move on to the high school then okay so the sat just a brief review, third year of high school, paper pencil aligned to the MLR, again, including the Common Core State Standards. It was given to our students on a school day, students throughout Maine. It was, last year it was April 5th. We had a 98% participation rate linked to released items if you're interested. Um, one of the interesting things that uh, I want to give Jeff credit for uncovering um, that was not on the slides that were originally sent to you is that the state's benchmarks for proficiency are actually higher than either the college, college boards, which is the author of the assessment, um, or SMCCs. Um, so you can see that. So the state set defined at or above proficiency at a 470 for ELA literacy and a 530 for math, um, whereas the college board said 460 or above. and in ELA literacy and 510 or above in math. And then SMCC, if you have a 450 or above in ELA literacy, then you go into a college level course. And if you have a 490 or above in math, same thing, you go into a college level course. So it's interesting that the state chose to do this. Um, and I don't know, I don't know why. Interested in finding out. But I, that may change the way you, you look at some of the data. So 
Um, again, we don't have cohort data, so we just look at, I mean, we do have the comps for you, the area comps. Um, but then I wanted to mention that, so, so for me, there, there is here a lot to celebrate. Um, I, it's, it's, it's important that we pay, pay attention to how our students are doing all along the way. Each grade level is a benchmark. Um, but to me, the SAT is really, have, have we done our job? Have we, have we gotten our students where they need to be? We want to graduate our students college and career ready. They're taking this assessment at the end of their junior year. We have one more year. Um, and so if you look at that data and you see that we're at this, this past year at, I'm sorry, I can't read it, 87, 87.5 is that? Okay, I forgot to bring my glasses up. Um, so we had a, 111 students take the SAT. Um, if you use the state's definition of proficiency, 97 of those 111 students were proficient. College Board definition is 98. If you use SMCC, 100, 100 of those 111 students, or 90% of our students, um, were at or above the state expectations. So that means that 11 of our students, at the end of their junior year, if they were going right on to college, would need to take a placement test to determine whether they were ready for college level work. I think that's pretty good. Any questions about that? And then the same thing with math. Um, math numbers lower across the board. Um, if we use the SMCC benchmark, then 82% or 20 of those 111 students would need to take a placement test at college. So you can bet that we're paying attention. Um, we know who those 20 students are and we want to make sure over the course of the next year um, that they are college and career ready. And last then, where are we in terms of uh, what's happening curriculum instruction-wise, intervention-wise, and where do we want to go? Um, so, Jeff, do you want to come up? Or?
that last year in a mini pilot based on the PSAT scores, um, having kids go to the Achino Center in Ohio. Well, you know, I wanted to say that this caused a fact because of other confounding variables that were in there. Some of the students may have been taking home prep courses as well. But uh, I think it's around 70% of the students who participated in that pilot program did that on the SAT. That was exciting. I think that's it. And just a word about the IQ Placer. It is, um, it is an online adaptive exam, and because of that, students get immediate feedback, and it's also a much shorter exam for so for students for whom the three and a half hour SAT is just is an exercise in, in endurance. Um, often the IQ Placer will will, will produce better and arguably more accurate results for students. And I think that's the present, yeah, there we go. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention under data is that, so um, even though we don't have cohort data with the SAT, um, it is important to us to get a read on our students in every year of high school and so we will have the grade 8 NWA taken in the spring that can inform intervention for the first semester of ninth grade. And then in the fall of ninth grade, students will take the grade 9, grade 8, 9 PSAT, and those results come back in January so they can inform intervention for the spring. And then we have the PSAT in the 10th grade and the 11th grade, as well as the SAT. So, so uh, lots of opportunities. Um, for us to gather data, data on our students and triangulate it with, with other, other data points, class performance, etc. Comments or questions from the board? One, one last comment. Okay. It's fun talking to Kathy this week. She and I worked together for a lot of years. But I, um, one thing I like about these top four districts and our comparisons were all small enough to be agile mm -hmm. and so that when we, even though this is a one data point test, we always have put quite a bit of emphasis on it. So with the agility of you to work with principals, to work with teachers, to work with interventionists and really target in on some of these um, weaker spots and come up with, whether it's use of your professional time, whether it's new use of interventionists or so forth, I would like to really encourage that continued focus on agility and responding to what we're seeing here that frankly has some alarming numbers in it. So yeah, we're really looking forward to digging in. Great. So. Thank you. So thank you for your attention to it, it really is just an introduction. We, yes. We hope to come back and, and give you more information. We'd love to hear more. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks thank you. Moving on to item 5D, the superintendent's report. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, a question was raised by um, a candidate school board recently asking um, if, if, when Lynn becomes a board member, are you given a, um, a, an email account through the town? And um, I was hearing different answers to that, and I, I met with Noel, who was in charge of technology for the entire town, and then also he wanted to bring in the town manager, Matt. And Matt informed me that the town is definitely moving in that direction, that as of December 1st, they want all um, uh, town council members to be using a, an email account through the town, and and that he would appreciate that the school would begin to move in that direction as well. So, um, if any of you are willing to move, I think the, 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 the thinking behind it is that when there are requests for right to know information, looking at emails and all, it's so much easier just to have one place, just pull them all, rather than having you have to go through all your personal emails, separate out personal from school work, um, and they've had several requests like that recently for the town and it's just been a reminder to him how convenient it is to have it all under 
one system. So if you're willing to um, have the town initiate an email address for you, if you would just let um, Andrea know, then she can um, have one set up for you and then you can start using that whenever it's convenient. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I just wanted you all to know that that uh, Peter Esposito, who runs our food service nutrition program, has initiated uh, what's called a, um, a backpack program, which provides meals for students to take home um, on weekends and over extended periods of time away from school when they can't get the advantage of meals and breakfast and lunch at school. And um, if you know of any family that would would benefit from that support. I mean, these are healthy snacks, um, good things, and don't necessarily require refrigeration. So if you know of families that might benefit from that, they should really speak to their school administration, nurses, administrators, and they'll get connected and the, that will be provided immediately. Um, I also wanted to bring to your attention that there seems to be um, an increase interest in the area of um, Cumberland County uh, of districts looking at starting time for schools. And I um, just wanted to bring to your attention that you know, right, right now our, our times are 7.55 for high school and middle school and 8.35 for K-4. But an extreme shift for next year in Scarborough will be their K-5 will start at 8 o'clock in the morning, their middle school will start at 9, and the high school will start at 8.50. And other districts in the area are beginning to look at, at a later start time, especially for high school as well. This becomes problematic in terms of scheduling students to go to PASS or Westbrook vocational schools when you're as much as an hour off um, it's really hard for those schools to schedule start times for their programs. It's also uh, difficult for after school programs to include athletics and, and other um, opportunities that bring schools together to, to work together or to compete. And so it's nothing that I think is for us a burning issue, but we have to be paying attention to the fact that there could be a growing number of schools moving to later start times, and we, you know, we could be wondering about that ourselves, I guess, at some point. I don't think it's an issue for this year, but I think it's something to think about but in the future to just keep an eye on it. Um, I know of two other schools in the area that are talking about moving closer to 9 o'clock starting times. So this is not, I don't think that maybe Scarborough now is an anomaly. I don't think that they're going to be uh, for very long. So, I just bring that to your attention. Um, I also wanted to be sure that you knew about, I think you received a notice from the Department of Education saying that the uh, proficiency the diploma rule, um, according to the state, has been that they have withdrawn um, the current proposed rules. That, that is not to say that they're moving away from the statute that says that we will have proficiency based education and diplomas. That still stands. What's in limbo? are the rules that, that get us there. And the state's using words such as they're looking for a process that's going to be um, substantially different in Chapter 134, and that in October and November, they're going to be asking to meet with teachers and administrators um, to, to explore all this. I mean, one of the obvious concerns that really been answered very well by the state, but I think that they've uh, not done their job, to be quite candid, and set a direction, they left it to local control, which um, at times can be chaotic. But the whole question around how do you measure and define proficiency with children uh, that are very, are very different from one another is, is part of what is, is, is out there. And we are very clear and I'm proud of us that we are not talking about different kinds of certificates or diplomas here at Cape. It's one diploma, everybody who graduates gets the same thing. So that's, I think, exactly where we want to be. But how we're going to be able to be sure that 
it, the, the challenge for proficiency is rigorous and appropriate for individual children. That's the challenge that others will, will be working on. We have administrators and teachers that will be um, weighing in on this at the various meetings that are offered throughout the state. Um, I heard today from the administrators and board members for CEF that the deadline for the fall proposals from the teachers and administrators and staff for, for grants is next Monday the 16th, so uh, it will be enjoyable to see what um, people come up with and what's approved. Um, I think that by late October they will be actually meeting with teachers and administrators to hear about their ideas and probably by November I'll have a list to show you and ensure what, what it, um, it has been approved. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we have a number of students that attend our schools on what's called a superintendent's agreement between superintendents. Uh, from a child attending a school where they don't, the family doesn't reside, but it's in the child's best interest to attend a school other than their local school. And Anthea Fuller has done a very, very good job, along with a lot of other things that she does incredibly well, of just monitoring and keeping record of that and tracking it. And then as part of what she does, she turns in to the state, notice of those children. And we each year receive seven additional monies uh, in terms of an offset for subsidy because of that. And this last year, we just recently I received a letter from the state saying that this year we're going to be receiving an additional $66,000. Um, that if it weren't for Andrew, this wouldn't be coming in as far as I could tell. And I just really want to acknowledge that. That's just, you know, that's unanticipated additional revenue that we are going to spend this year, but it's money that will help fund your next budget. That's sweet. So uh, thank you to her for that. Uh, I'm through. Thank you, Howard. Yep. Item 5E. I'd like to just update the public on our superintendent search. So I'm excited to say that we have launched our 2017 superintendent search. I'm not doing anything. Um, we began advertising a little over a week ago, um, advertising broadly using online media as well as print media, and um, also what I find to be most effective is word of mouth. Um, word of mouth um, discussion about Cape Elizabeth is incredibly positive this year. It's, it's an asset to us, so that's really exciting. Um, Interested candidates can go to our um, website if they want to um, learn about our district and learn about this particular process and timeline. Um, we have a um, superintendent search site, which you can access <coughs> from the main page of the Cape Elizabeth district site. And um, candidates may go to the employment page of the um, Cape Elizabeth district site and enter in through um, Applatrack that way. Um, people that are interested in the timeline can click on the timeline link. I'm not going to go through all the timelines, but what I will share is that the board is moving aggressively. Um, we will begin interviewing um, mid-November and hope to have that good match candidate before winter break in December. So I encourage the public to be uh, paying attention to opportunities to come in and you know, meet finalists and that sort of thing. We're, we're hoping to have um, participation from um, parents and community members, um, administration at the central office, as well as um, building level um, students, parents, I said parents already, teachers, um, as well as board members. Um, that group, minus the students, will um, comprise our search committee. Our search committee will not only read and rank applications and make recommendations for first round interviews, but that committee will conduct first round as well as second round interviews because we have found that having that kind of longitudinal approach where, where people are able to kind of move along together in the process is very helpful. Um, at this time, we have had several 
many more than several several people um, email the board with um, their interest in being a part of the search committee and um, what we are doing is we're trying to cast a wide net we'd like to have a, a very broad um, representation of um, parents or over all three schools we're hoping not to have everybody on the, the committee that just represents the middle school for instance so um, we are not just sticking to very um, uh, you know narrow parameters we're really looking for you know do you, where do you where are your students have you um, participated in um, town boards or committees before are you you know we're trying to pull people in who've never been pulled in before that sort of thing so um, we'll be getting back to people soon that committee work will begin soon um, the application deadline is November 6th so that's really when the committee gets going so I'll be getting back to you next month and letting you know how that's going. John. I have one little blurb for people who might know excellent qualified superintendent candidates. This is a great high achieving district, one board, great community support, mm -hmm. zero dropout rate. Mm -hmm. Just in a capsule. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to like here. Thank you. Moving on to item six, new business. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, this is um, a request for you to approve a new plan for the evaluation of your principles. We have a plan. We don't feel the plan is as uh, clean and as useful as we would like. Um, we mean the principles that I. And um, we plagiarized the heck out of the plan from Falmouth, find it to be much more uh, streamlined, straightforward, useful to us. We've submitted it to the Department of Ed. They're satisfied, but they need before they um, put it uh, as our new plan to have you formally approve this. So we think this is a step forward. It's a plan we want to use this year for several more years. Uh, before maybe we might modify it a bit, but we, we think this is a much better starting point than what we have currently. So we would ask for your approval of a new plan as submitted in your packet. Thank you, Helen. You're welcome. May I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the Cape Elizabeth School Department's Administrator's Performance Evaluation and Professional Growth Plan. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Item 6B, may I have a motion please? <coughs> I move that we uh, approve the following 2017-18 administrative, athletic, and extracurricular personnel nominations as listed in our agenda for tonight. I noticed there's just one blank under theater class productions. Is there any update, Mr. Shedd, on that? Yep, I would propose, and I'm sorry it wasn't in the packet, uh, Mr. Richard Mullen to do the theater class productions. Okay. So I move we include that name in the list of accepted athletic and extracurricular personnel nominations. May have a second? Thank you. Discussion? I'd like to thank everybody who's willing to step up and be a part of the extracurricular and athletic community. Without your help, these students wouldn't have these opportunities, so we thank you. There's mentors on this list too, people who professionally step up Absolutely. to work with some of our newer teachers, so that's great. Thank you, I didn't flip it over to, <laughs> thank you. All those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you. Item 6C, may I have a motion please? 
I would like to move that we approve JJJ, High School Co-Curricular and Extracurricular Activities, Eligibility and Code of Conduct Policy as revised. A second. Discussion? Yes, I'd like to um, turn your attention to page two of the policy language you have in your packets. And I'd also like to thank our student representative for some commentary about this continued worries about this, I understand, but I also appreciate very much that Mr. Shedd has now met, as he said he would, with a wide range of students at every grade level. And one of the small tweaks he'd like to make to the language, which I think is highly acceptable, is around this idea of habits of work grades um, as they go down this path. So. Uh, his suggestion is, um, as you know, before the academic grades, we're passing a minimum of four classes, grades of 70 or above per main principal association requirements for athletic and extracurricular eligibility, and passing habits of work grades, grades of 70 or above, in all courses or all but one course. That was one thing that he talked about students about. So if there was just one class where there was some issue with timeliness, sort of to your point, that that would not preclude eligibility. So if we add the phrase at the end of that first sentence, passing habits of work grades, grades of 70 or above, in all courses or all but one course would be the expectation for eligibility. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'm very satisfied that this uh, is a reasonable first step for us in really encouraging the um, timeliness and the responsibility of responding to teachers that we're hoping for as we go down this path of habits of work. And I think any other questions that arise of concerns, Mr. Shedd seems completely open and working through student concerns about that. So I think the policy, I really encourage that the policy be passed this evening. I'd like to echo Barbara in thanking Mr. Shedd for going back and working through this with the students. It's clear that you've put a lot of time and energy into this. And um, to our student representatives' point around confusion around what, what does ineligibility mean? Does it mean no practices? Does it mean just no contests? I think it would, it would really be wise to make that crystal clear and um, I think we can that may not need to be in the policy at this time it's something that can be worked out in um, athletic handbook or that sort of thing but um, I'm sure the, the the board would like to, to also have that clarified it's, it's a fair point um, but again just so grateful for your willingness to do that work and thank yeah, you. I'm, yeah, I'm guessing that it's that it's synonymous with whatever academic ineligibility rules are in existence. So it would just be good if there is continued question about that, just to clarify. Thank you. Further discussion? Who's sure. Oh, sorry. Uh, Heather. Oh, Heather. One question. I was just going to say, just from the student's perspective, I think adding that flexibility of one class sort of takes away the ambiguity of the teacher's decisions um, and allows for sort of a warning or a, a, a chance for a student to get their, their grade up um, before being completely ineligible. So I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. All of I'm just going to add a thing. Barbara, thanks for really nice work on this, and, mm -hmm. and to the students. Just a reminder: these habits of work things are really, really important, and we hope this will reflect that. And you, and I think you'll see that more and more, and we'll work through that as they get rolled out. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, John. All those in favor? Thank you. Thanks. Item six D. May I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the Cape Elizabeth High School Model UN World Affairs Council trip to Boston College for the Model UN Conference in Boston <coughs> on um, March 16th through the 18th of next year. May I have a second? Yes, sir. Thank you. Discussion? 
Jeff, if we may ask what seem, may seem like the perennial questions about um, are all students that are part of Model UN given the opportunity to participate? Is there fundraising to help with the defraying of costs, that sort of thing? So World Affairs Council does have a budget to support. Um, but they, these are expensive programs. The students do a great job working together to raise funds, and certainly it's open to anybody. And if there are students who need particular assistance, then there are, it, it's, that's found. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6E, may I have a motion please? I move that we approve Cape Elizabeth High School's Model UN World Affairs Council trip to Dartmouth College uh, for the Model UN Conference in Hanover, New Hampshire, April 6th through the 8th of next year. A second. Discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6F. May I have a motion, please? Uh, actually, before you make a motion, I think there's an amendment that we, uh, Kathy might have made to this. Okay. Yes, indeed. There's mm -hmm. a very minor change, um, and I've, I've got a red line copy for you, and I'll just explain the rationale for that, and then we can proceed with the vote. Okay, so just uh, two, well, first of all, just by way of background, so Troy and I believe that this is a really important position to have as we um, implement proficiency-based education in the leadership structure um, at Cape Elizabeth Middle School, and this is true for most middle schools, um, is, is by, by grade level, grade level team leader. Um, and then there might be a, an allied arts team leader, et cetera, but you don't typically have the equivalent of department chairs in the middle school. But when you're trying to implement proficiency-based education, you really need a department chair-like equivalent. Um, you need a point person for ELA, a point person for math, a point person for science, and a point person for social studies. And that's what we're looking to create with this position. And it would be funded through the um, federal and state money that we get to implement proficiency-based education. So the two changes that we wanted to make were to um, clarify that um, uh, rather than rather than these poor people having to meet with Troy and me, say, every day, that it will just be monthly. So from regularly to monthly. Um, and then we eliminated the uh, need for that person to attend, these people to attend team leader meetings. But everything else stands as was originally in your packet. Is this a cre are these uh, new positions being created? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. It's full time? Is it full time? Well, no, these are stipended positions. So these, yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, these are stipend. These are these are um, uh, leadership positions. Um, Just beginning with those four content areas. Yes. <coughs> well, we already have on. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there is already an allied arts team leader on the grade level team, right? And is there one for world languages too already? Yes. Right. So. But again, the, 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 the core course is represented by team leaders, but you could have a team leader who, te well, every teacher at the middle school teaches two of the four courses. So we really need dedicated uh, content area folk. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, would you explain the funding of this, please? I'm sorry? I was would you explain you. the funding? Oh, yes. So we, um, we receive money from the state, uh, we have received money from the state to um, implement proficiency-based education. It's called transition grant money. And so we will pay the stipend out of that transition grant money. Um, and we figure we have enough money to pay that stipend for the next two years. And then if at the, 
um, in that second year, we feel that this is something we want to continue, then we would um, we would need to budget for it um, going forward. And using also local stipends funding. in line with what team leaders earn? Um, so this stipend is in line with the stipend that the um, teachers who serve on the teacher effectiveness committee are receiving because the responsibilities are comparable. Um, John? So just to be clear, these new positions are revenue, new, are budget neutral. That is correct, yes. Just to be very clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're, we're actually using the funds that were designed specifically for this purpose. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Good thinking. I was going to ask you about how this impacts budget. Um, may, may I have a motion, please? Yeah, I'll move that we approve the co-curricular job description for content leader middle school. May I have a second? John okay. As a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Item 7, committee reports. I'll start. Um, the Town Comprehensive Planning Committee, its next meeting is October 23rd at 7 p.m. Um, Many of you hopefully have gotten in the mail uh, a, a card ref with a link to an online survey which is being sent out to everybody in the community. It's easy to miss, but if you know to look out for it, it's, it's there. If you don't um, think you've received it, you can go to the town website and there is a link right there to the, the comprehensive plan survey, which is different from the forum uh, that you register for and every two weeks they ask, they pose different questions. I think the current question has to do with um, cell coverage and um, expanding data and, and internet service throughout the, the community. So the forum, the questions on the forums last for usually about two weeks. Once you register, you're free to interact and look at other people's um, answers. But I would say that this um, survey is really important that everybody participate in every voter in the, in the town. Thank you for serving on that committee. And that's a big commitment. Thank you. Um, any other committee reports at this time? I know our committees are just getting going for the school year. Um, I will just make a brief update. The superintendent search committee has not gotten going yet, but we will be meeting soon. Um, all members of that committee will need to um, have a brief confidentiality and protocol, I'll call it training, but it's more of a, sh a conversation, and um, sign a confidentiality agreement. We will um, meet next week with, with different groups. We're trying to be flexible and, and meet with different people's schedules, and um, then the committee work will begin. Any other committee reports at this time? Okay. Item eight, school board agenda requests. John? So in conjunction with Howard's sort of mention of start times, I'd like to request that for a, some future time, consideration of on the agenda, a workshop work in conjunction potentially with the calendar committee or the, and or the wellness committee, uh, a workshop on start times. And the reason I say that start times is something that I've looked at uh, extensively. And one of the things that I know from looking at that is if you don't begin the conversation early and build it the right way, you don't succeed. You may change your start time, but what happens then is hockey practice is at 5 a.m. and you don't get the benefit of changing your start times. <clears throat> so you have to do it with people on board, having a discussion and understanding what you're in for. So I'd like to sort of get that on the agenda and move it through the right committees and have the right participatory process because this is something that's not going away. It's happening. All the folks at PAS last time I was there were all talking about it. It's on their radar, so they're trying to get it coordinated. And now this is Scarborough moving, Biddeford and Stockholm moved earlier, earlier 
uh, this is something that's coming and we need to be prepared for it. And if we're going to do it, do it right. And so uh, we're going to need those discussions with wellness calendar and a workshop with the community. Thank you, Jim. All school board agenda requests um, may be made via email or phone call. We don't do well with smoke signals. Um, to myself, to Susanna as uh, vice chair or Howard, um, we like for, for business meetings, uh, we need to post at least five business days ahead of time. So uh, make sure that you have your agenda requests in plenty of time before meetings. Item nine, announcements of upcoming meetings. Barbara. So policy will get back together again prior to our workshop on October 24th, which is a Thursday. We'll be meeting at 5.30. Thursday. Agenda, I'm sorry, Tuesday, uh, October 24th. And the agenda in place will be posted. Susanna, you've already talked about Town Comp. Thank October you. October 23rd. Thank you, Seven. Any other upcoming meetings? Okay. Item 10. May I have a motion, please? And then we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Thank you.